I've posted a couple videos showing how you can increase the number of days that you ski or snowboard for the year by working remotely from Europe. But those videos mainly provided tips and just gave you a general sense of the concept. What's it like to do it for real? Well, I'm doing it for the third year in a row, so I'm going to do a daily vlog to show you what it's like. Diario realmente significa semanal en Europa. ¿Cómo parece pensar que hay en Chile? How is this guy still trolling me from South America when I'm in Europe right now? Bro, you posted two daily vlogs during your seven days at Portillo this summer, and your second wasn't until you got back to the U.S. All right, let's make it a weekly vlog, because it is true, I failed miserably at posting a daily vlog for Portillo this summer. So this year's plan is four weeks in Europe. One week at Villatea in Italy, the second week at Team Val d'Isère in France, the third at Lazarc in France, and the last week at Chamonix in France. If you try this yourself, you'll typically leave North America on a Friday and arrive in Europe on a Saturday. So we left New York on Friday night and arrived in Geneva the following morning. Now if you've seen my past videos, one tip is to use travel days to explore Europe. We are going to drive from Geneva through France to Villatea, Italy. It's only about a three hour drive, so we thought we could explore Annecy, France or some other town. But of course, we got hit by traffic at the Mont Blanc Tunnel in France, which turned it into a five hour trip. So the first day was a failure in terms of exploring. One thing I stressed in a past video is the importance of setting up your accommodations well so that you can work efficiently as soon as you get back from skiing and boarding. The plan is for everybody to set up a workstation in the main living area, two at the dining table and one on the couch. For times when more than one person is on a call, one bedroom has a ledge and a stool where one person can go and take the call in private. We've got one transformer centered by the table where everybody can hook up all their devices to charge. Yes, cell phones and laptops might be able to work here on European current, but we just don't want to take any chances because if something goes wrong, we're kind of screwed. All right, first day on the slopes is a Sunday. That means a full day of skiing because I don't have to work. But of course, with Sunday comes crowds. The crowds are okay. There's a couple of lifts where I had to wait maybe five minutes. That's much better than what you get on the west coast of the U.S. on a weekend. And the rest of the time, I basically had no line. I got a great question in the comments section of one of my prior videos asking what sort of visa someone needs to be able to pull this off. Well, I'm in the San Sicario section of Villatea. San Sicario. Sicario es una palabra española. Calm down, dude. I'm in Italy, not South America or Spain. Ooh, return shots fired. Nice, bro. All right, so let's talk about visas as I go down slope number 76. Unfortunately, there's no clear answer because it depends on a lot of different factors. First, what do you do for work? Second, who's your employer? Third, which country are you going to? What are their visa options? How long are you going to work remotely from there? So I can't give you a simple answer, but one thing, a little bit of ice there. One thing I can definitely tell you as I stick to the side where all the snow has been pushed by everybody coming down here is to check with your employer because there may be tax reporting consequences depending on how long you work. So get your employer on board and then also speak to somebody who knows about these issues. Don't go on the internet and just look at what people say because you'll find all sorts of misinformation there. Just speak to somebody who knows, and then you can probably make it work. Some countries have what's called a digital nomad visa, which started during the pandemic as people were working remotely. Not all of them have it in Europe, but again, depending on your circumstances, that may be something that would work well for you, particularly if you want to stay a very long time while you're skiing and working remotely in Europe. So I get a text from my friend Jen asking, what is the Apre ski scene like there? She has a blog called Here for the Apre and knows a lot about Apre ski in Europe. So I told her there's nobody here at this resort, so it's gonna be dead. It's 10 a.m., walking to the slopes a little bit late. In the U.S., it'd be pretty crowded right now, but here, empty. So she then texted me and said, no, you're wrong. There actually is a scene there. It's at this place called Largargut. So during our dinner hour, we went over there to check it out, and it was awesome. Typical European après ski, which you don't get in the U.S. Yo. 
One of the downsides about working remotely is that that happens during work hours. If you're actually going to do this yourself, you could on a Saturday or Sunday go there and enjoy it in full. By the way, I'd recommend you check out Jen's blog because she has so many great tips, not just about Alpre Ski, but also about lodging and travel to and from European resorts. Very cool. Okay, dinner time strategy. What I've come up with are three things. One, either get frozen food. Two, make your own dinner. Three, go to a restaurant. It's 1 p.m. East Coast time right now, 7 p.m. here. We don't have time to go sit in a restaurant. So our strategy is to either make food for ourselves or go to a restaurant here in Sestriere. You can order, they'll give it to you in a box or a bag, and you can also get a bottle of wine and take it home. Can't do that in the U.S. Tonight, we're going to a restaurant, get some food. Tomorrow night, we'll cook. If you're going to go the cooking route, definitely confirm what options you have in your accommodations. It's not a guarantee that you're going to have everything. Oven, microwave, stove, and on top of that, it'd be good to check what type of grocery stores are in your area. Here in Sestriere, it's a very small grocery store with just a limited amount of raw protein like chicken and meat, and the rest is basically just snacks and dry pasta. So if you come all the way to Europe, which is spending a significant amount of money to do this work remotely endeavor, you kind of hope that you'd have incredible snow so you can enjoy the Alps. And unfortunately for me, the past two years, that hasn't been the case. It's my European curse. It's not really a curse. Not a curse because out of 45 days, I've had 41 days of pure sun. But what that means is you're not getting fresh snow. If you've skied or boarded a lot, you'll be familiar with these conditions. The snow itself is kind of granular. So in the morning, the slopes are nice and crisp because they were groomed overnight. But within an hour or two, all that snow has been scraped off and reveals a whole bunch of ice in the center of the slope. But you know, after 41 days, I've learned how to manage it pretty well. I mean, just last week, I was in Winter Park and we had tons of snow. I think 15 inches in one day. They had avalanche issues. That was the best snow I've had in the past couple of years. But I still had to use vacation days to be there. Here, zero vacation. It's a work day. To give you an example of what we're dealing with, if you go on a groomed slope like this one right here, you're going to have a lot of ice in the center, particularly by the end of the day. It's been kicked up as these skiers go down the middle. So what I tend to do is stick right over here to the side because a lot of the snow gets kicked over there. Alternatively, you can always go here just off the slope, which is what I tend to do when it's available because that snow is crusty, less icy, and much more fun to ski. That's what my European curse of nothing but sun and very little fresh snow has taught me over the past two years. So I'd much rather ski that than over on that slope where there's a lot of ice. Even when I'm holding this camera so I can't pull plant with my left arm, that was much nicer. My first two days at work have not been intense. That's perfect if you're trying to pull this off. If you're gonna have really intense work days, well, it's probably gonna compromise some of your sleep or time on the mountain. But again, this is a work day. So if you were at home, you wouldn't get any time on the mountain. So whether it's two hours or five hours, it's a bonus. I'm averaging five, so winning. Bro, drop the Charlie Sheen reference. You sound like my dad. Normally, in addition to filming a video about skiing while working remotely, I'd probably also do a video about Via Latte itself. Because it's not fully open, I don't think it would be a fair assessment. So I'll just kind of give you some observations about Via Latte in this video. Fifth largest ski and snowboard resort in the world, it hosted many of the events when the Winter Olympics were in Torino. So for example, Sestriere, where we're staying, has the Olympic Village, and you see the Olympic logo everywhere all over the resort. We learned some really cool history about Sestriere. There are these very distinctive cylindrical buildings. The story behind them is that in the early 1930s, Senator Giovanni Agnelli decided to come to this area, which was at that time pure snow except for one church, and build a hotel so the area could be used for skiing. There was apparently a difference of opinion between he and his son. His son wanted to cater to the elite, while he wanted to make skiing affordably. He won out, and this distinctive hotel that accommodates 200 people was built. Soon after, they built a second one, also cylindrical. Neither of these hotels have stairs. Instead, it's one cylindrical hallway winding all the way up the building, kind of like the Guggenheim Museum in New York. And when you go inside, the hotels are still pretty basic, so I'm sure the senator will be happy that they still seem to be economical accommodations. And even more modern buildings at Sestriere have kept that motif going. Another day on the slopes and the continuation of my European curse of pure sun and no new snow. One of the fun things about being in Europe is noticing the subtle differences. For example, the signs that tell you to clear the area after getting off a chairlift. They have those in the US, but here they have to translate them into multiple languages. So free up the space becomes liberate the space. Another one is ski shape. 
In the US, the trend is to have fatter skis, powder skis, all mountain skis, skis for tricks. You don't see as many carving skis as you do in Europe, where that's the predominant ski. Since I have carving skis, I guess I fit in better here than in the US. One other thing you notice is how proud Italians are of being Italian on the ski slopes. There are so many people who have ITA or the Italian flag or colors on their outfits. I really don't see that in any other country. It's really cool. Yo, trash containers. Too bad we can't throw this vlog in there too. I posted a video on Les Trois Vallées, which is the largest ski resort in the world. And one of my recommendations was to stay at accommodations that are at the highest elevation possible. And here is an example here in Villa Tea. Because the snow isn't great, coming down to the lower elevations, look at this, there is very little snow. That's why we chose Sestriere. Much more snow up there, even though it's not the best. This is kind of like spring skiing-ish conditions. So you may notice that we rented a car. There are a lot of ways to get to the ski resorts in Europe train, bus, private transfer, or car rental like us. When you break it down, if you're multiple people splitting the rental car costs, it could be cheaper than a private transfer. Obviously, bus and train are gonna be the least expensive, but for where we're going, train doesn't really work, and bus can be inconvenient. For example, if you wanna go from one of the ski resorts we're hitting back to Geneva, the bus leaves at 4 a.m. if you're catching an early morning flight. So for us, car is the way to go. Don't let go Chasing a bitch